Hey everybody, Chad with Patriot Astro here. I've had a lot of direct requests asking me to take you through the build process for my remote imaging PC, right? This is the mini PC that stays with my mount. Um, I have one assigned to each mount. It's a little bit easier that way in case I have extra mounts running any given night. But this gives me the ability from the inside of my house, from the warmth of my living room, to be able to connect uh, and remote control this PC, manage my entire imaging session without having to be outside and directly connected. It also doesn't require really long uh, ethernet cables or really long USB cables, right? I basically have this thing powered sitting directly uh, with my gear and then it's Wi-Fi uh, to, um, to my equipment in the home. Now, one thing I do want to say is that we are going to take the entire build process from start to finish and get through this extremely quickly in this video. You may have to pause it at times, right? I'm going to accelerate through as much as possible and I'm going to call out all of the key points. There is an accompanying blog on my website, www.patriotastro.com. Um, I'll put a link to that in the comments. It's got a little bit more detail. You could print it out and use it as a guide or a template and then fall back on the video whenever necessary. So what we're actually gonna do is gonna go through a build. Now in this particular video, I'm gonna use a stick PC. So I'm looking for a low cost, low power requirement alternative to what I'm currently using. Um, however, I will in the comments put all of the gear, everything I've done, um, as well as a blog entry that's gonna go through a little bit more detail on the build process. So um, again, this is a small uh, mini PC stick that you can use um, or you could choose to use something a little bit more powerful. Uh, but again, from a cost alternative or the power alternative, if you're gonna be taking this mount and going into the field and running off a battery, cutting that amperage down can give you more imaging time over a day or two or three, depending on your uh, battery capacity um, and other imaging uh, and battery requirements. So first things first, you're gonna need a PC. Again, in this video, I'm gonna use a stick PC here. Very small, low power requirement, uh, but extremely portable. You could go a little bit bigger and use a mini PC if you want. We'll talk about the requirements in a minute. You're also gonna need a keyboard, video, and mouse. So at least at the beginning, before remote control is capable, uh, on the stick itself, uh, you're gonna need something to um, access the computer. So uh, an HDMI uh, screen of some sort, maybe your existing computer screen in the house will work, and a keyboard uh, with a mouse capability is nice, but you may already have something, right? You don't have to do something like this. I like this because I can use it with my Raspberry Pi projects. I can also use this very uh, uh, easily when I'm traveling, right? It's something I put in a backpack, so that's pretty easy. Um, we're also going to need internet access. Your existing home wireless probably works, but you may need to extend it outdoors, out by the driveway, out behind the house, wherever you have Wi-Fi um, access for your rig. You're also going to need power. Uh, 110, 220 at the house is going to be pretty straightforward, but you want to make sure that it's something you can adapt, something you can take into the field for when you go remote. So we'll talk about that a little bit uh, as well later. Mini PC requirements. First things first, the processor. Two or four cores, four thread capable. You have a guider, an imaging camera, something like Nina running a sequence. You have remote control. There's a lot happening that is processor intensive. Make sure you have enough processor overhead available. Stay away from Celeron N and Atom processors if you can. Those mobile PC processors uh, may not be able to keep up. If it's all you can do, it, you'll probably get away with it, but I like to give myself enough CPU overhead when possible. Memory. Four gig minimum, go with eight gig if you can. Again, this is gonna come down to pricing, but you wanna give yourself enough room to process those images um, as you're running throughout the evening. Uh, disc, the disc that comes with this is probably fine. 32 gig, 64 gig SSD. We're talking about running the operating system and your uh, applications off that disk. Uh, for me, I'm not saving my images directly to disk. I'm putting it on the micro SD card that has a slot on this, uh, this stick PC, or I can actually run a USB drive uh, very easily uh, off this. So I'm just gonna store all my images there. It also makes my images more portable at the end of an imaging session. I can just pull it without having to take the whole PC apart or, or, or pulling this uh, away from the mount. I can leave this mounted. USB ports. USB ports, you want at least two USB 3.0 ports or 3.1 ports, um, but you're gonna need that to at least have uh, your imaging and your mount 
connected. Uh, you may need more USB ports, but again, your camera may have USB ports on the back of it, or you may need to add a powered USB hub to this. That's not a problem, but start with at least two USB 3 ports on the box itself. Wi-Fi is important. We want to remote control this without a cable requirement. So Wi-Fi is, is a must. Ethernet or cabled uh, Ethernet network to the internet um, is handy, but it may not be a requirement. Wi-Fi is an absolute must. Power. 110, 220 is great when you're here at the house, when you can get AC power, uh, but make sure it is something you can adapt to run off a battery. So most of what you'll find, the bigger boxes, you may find them 12 volt, that'd be great. We can go straight into a battery. Uh, if it is five volt, we can adapt that. And I do have other videos showing you how to do that with a small buck converter um, that'll, that'll allow you to go 12 volt to five volt, step down, no problem. Size, make sure it's portable and it's small. It's something that you don't wanna have a big battery draw, and it's also something you wanna be able to take with you um, on the road if possible, if you're going to a dark site. Operating system. Windows 10 Pro for me is a must. Um, I want to use remote desktop. Windows remote desktop protocol is fantastic for transmitting those uh, screens that we need. Uh, there are alternatives, there are ways around that, but I have found that I end up with more problems when I'm not going straight Windows RDP, so Windows 10 Pro is ideal. We're gonna go through a Windows 10 install and I'm gonna do it very, very quickly. I have more details in my blog entry, but just pay attention, make sure you're getting everything going through and not missing any steps. Uh, most of it is pretty straightforward, but you do wanna make sure you patch completely. You wanna make sure you install some sort of security uh, program, antivirus, et cetera. Make sure that you configure your power management, your update cycles, your active hours. Um, go through everything step by step and you're gonna be just fine. So here we are booting the system for the first time. I'm obviously speeding this up. Uh, if you've done a Windows 10 install, you know it takes a little bit longer than this, but we set our localization and then we create our first user account. And then it's going to churn a little bit longer. I have cut a lot of time off the front end of this video. So be prepared to take a little bit more time than you're seeing here. Once you're in, you want to connect to your Wi-Fi network. Uh, I'm using a guest Wi-Fi network at my house. You could just use your regular Wi-Fi network. That's fine. Next date and time. Um, I like to manually set some of my parameters, including the time zone, and then make sure it's synchronized, double checking the clock. The next thing we want to do is go to About My PC. The reason we do that is a couple things. First thing is we want to check the addition. I want Windows 10 Pro for remote desktop capabilities, and I want to rename my PC to something that makes more sense, something I'll recognize on my network. Here I'll just call it Astro uh, Stick 2, and uh, I will not reboot yet. We're going to end up rebooting here shortly. Now, you do want to make sure your IP address is um, something that sticks uh, over time. There's a couple ways to do that. One way is to go manually change it on your Wi-Fi adapter and you can go in and actually set that, set the network mask, set the IP address, set the gateway. You may have to set DNS. You can use Google's DNS of 8888 and 8844 if you need to. I prefer to uh, set a DHCP reservation in my router. I have an Orbi router at home and if I go in I can see the uh, existing DHCP address that was granted to me when I originally connected here just moments ago. And uh, from there, uh, my system allows me to select the device and set a permanent reservation. That way I know every time my machine connects from this point forward to my home network, it will always get the same IP address. Now this is gonna be important for when I want to remote desktop this system later. And I know that every day I get the same address. Um, most of your system should support this capability and it's something you should certainly consider. Now, the next thing we wanna do is start updating our machine. Uh, very likely with a pre-installed OS, it's gonna be pretty old. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're setting that um, and updating it. We also wanna set active hours. Active hours control when our system will download and install updates, uh, when updates become available. Because we work through the evening, we do not want our system to reboot in the middle of the night. You want to set your active hours. When your updates are complete, go ahead and do your reboot. Let your updates uh, go through those reboot cycles. You'll likely have to do multiple sets of updates. Now I'll go to add remove programs. I like to see if there's anything I don't need that has already been installed since this was a pre-installed operating system. 
I can also go check in the uh, start menu as well. Uh, it's, it's just because there occasionally is extra software packages that I just don't need on my system. Next, I go to turn Windows features on and off. I always add .NET 3.5 because I know there's a couple of our Astro programs that require that. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now to speed up our process later. Next, it's off to power and sleep. Um, it is important to make sure that your screen and your PC does not turn off in the middle of an imaging session. Um, it can cause problems, right? So we're going to go ahead and make a couple changes in here. We're going to go in and set our power mode to high performance, right? We're not trying to save battery. We're trying to make sure that we can keep running. Again, making sure that displays don't sleep. The computer itself doesn't sleep. You can also go into the advanced settings, and there's a number of things to look at here, such as the USB settings, where we can make sure that the USB B devices do not get suspended um, at any point, right? So we want to make sure that everything is running um, as we expect it to run all the time. This is a good uh, point in the install to go ahead and add any additional applications you may want. Here, I'm just going to quickly add Google Chrome and Adobe Reader. Uh, the reason I do that, certainly Adobe Reader, is because we're going to have PDFs that come down with our installs. We want to make sure that we can read release notes, things like that. Google Chrome, I add it because I like to Chromecast to my TV from time to time. So next, we're going to go ahead and set up remote desktop. It's a pretty straightforward process. Just go into the remote desktop uh, configuration and enable it, right? So we just turn it on. Uh, you confirm that process. And um, the user account that you set up should already have access. So we should be pretty much ready to go at this point. So we can just go ahead and reboot our system. And now we're going to go on to downloads. The first set of downloads we're going to do is mostly related to the astrophotography hardware, right? So mount drivers, mount software, um, imaging camera drivers um, and software packages, filter wheel, focuser drivers and software. So make sure you identify all of your hardware and make sure you can get uh, all of that software. Now pay attention, you're going to need very likely multiple software packages per device. So in some cases you're going to have a software package that is an application local in Windows. You're going to have a Windows driver or a native driver and you're going to have ASCOM drivers. So you may have to download anywhere between one and three pieces of software per component. So pay attention to that and make sure you get everything you need. We do have a number of downloads um, and to keep track of those as we install them, I like to create a done folder. Um, I put an underscore in front of it so it always ends up at the top of the alphabetical list once we have all of our files here in the download section. You can see I've listed the files I'm going to be pulling down. Now your list will vary, right? It depends on the hardware you're using. Now you very likely with ASCOM always need ASCOM platform. I'm going to pull the latest 6.5 SP1. For my mount, I need to go get the EQ Mod Project um, uh, software that I can pull down that'll support a number of my um, uh, mounts that I will use over time with this particular system. Um, from there, there's uh, other software you can get either from the ASCOM page or go directly to the manufacturer. I'm going to go to Pegasus Astro next and pull down uh, one of the focusers that I do use from time to time, uh, depending on the setup I'm using. Now, in this particular case, notice there are multiple software packages I need. I do have a software desktop application, USB drivers, and an ASCOM driver. Sometimes it'll be a little bit easier, like with QHY and my filter wheel that I use from time to time, they have an all-in-one that can be downloaded, but I also do need to pull down the Pullmaster software, which is a completely separate system, and in that case, I do have a Windows desktop application and a Windows native driver. From there, it's off to my camera downloads. Now, I almost exclusively have been using ZWO cameras, so I can go ahead and pull down the ASCOM drivers and native drivers uh, for that. I'm not going to pull down any additional support applications at this time. Now, there is one thing that I did forget, and you'll likely find that you forget things and then remember them later as well. I have another focuser that I use with my Canon lenses. It's by Astro Mechanics, and I need to get those drivers as well in a desktop utility. So they have ASCOM drivers and a desktop utility that I may use from time to time. Next set of downloads we need is our astrophotography tools. So things like PHD2 guiding, Nina, um, plate solving software, make sure you get the associated databases. But we're going to go ahead and do that now, download everything we need, and then we can move on to the next step. 
So quite similarly, we're going to continue our download uh, process here. First, I'm going to get PHD2. Now you can download the regular stable release. I'm going to use the Dev5 um, release because I want multi-star guiding. So I'm going to go ahead and get that. But I did download both. Now on Tanina, I'm going to go get downloads. You can get 1.10, which is the stable release, or you can pull down the 111 nightly. I'm going to pull down the 111 nightly here, um, as well as the associated Sky Atlas that you see at the bottom of the page. Now I'm going to go get my plate solving software. For that, I use ASTAP. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that down. I'm going to pull down the primary program, but I'm also going to pull down a database. I'm going to use H18 because I occasionally use my Celestron C8 with a very long, long focal length. And because of that, I'm going to want the uh, H18 database. I'm also going to pull down SharpCap. I use SharpCap for both solar and planetary imaging. So I want to make sure I have that local as well. So I'll go ahead and get that. And then once I'm done there, I can pull down, again, anything else you may need from a software perspective. I'll pull Solarium down. I probably won't install it by the end of this video, but it'll be there and ready to go. Um, make sure you get the latest release uh, for that. And there could even be some additional support packages you may choose to install as well with Stellarium. You can see there's a lot of software we have. and it's just about time to start installing it, but we should have everything we need and we're about ready to go. All right, at this point you wanna collect some information. You don't necessarily need to do it now, but I find that having it handy, having it written down is gonna make your life easier when you get into the installations, right? So we wanna make sure that we have things like focal lengths, um, pixel sizes, right? Um, all of the information we might need either within Nina or setting up our drivers, like our filter wheel filter locations, right? That would be handy to have when we're in the driver setting that up. So we wanna make sure we have all of this ready. Another one you wanna make sure you have is your site location information and you may need this for multiple sites here in the video I'm only going to do a single site as a demo but make sure when you get site information you have altitude latitude and longitude and when you get your latitude and longitude you specifically want to grab both decimal and non-decimal information some applications will require the decimal format some require the non-decimal so have it all or you may find yourself struggling in the field so for information gathering, I like to set up a text file to grab this information. You can certainly do it with a pencil and paper. Either way works. Go to the manufacturer websites and pull the data you're going to need. In many cases, we're talking about pixel sizes, chip sizes, resolutions, maybe unity gain settings, um, focal lengths, uh, you know, it, anything like that. Now, the one critical piece you cannot forget is to get your site location information. For that, I like to use gps-coordinates.net. Just um, scroll down the page and enter in your address. Once your address is in, uh, you'll have a drop-down box. You should be able to find your specific address. And once you see it there, you can um, get your GPS coordinates. And again, you want to be as specific as possible down to the street uh, address level. Now, once you have that info, again, you should have DD, decimal degrees, and DMS, which is non-decimal. Gather both sets of information, and then on the right-hand side, you can click the altitude button to get your altitude in meters. All right, the first part of our install, now that we have our software, is going to be pretty straightforward. It's all of our component installs, right? So ASCOM platform and all of our software and hardware uh, dependent drivers and installations that need to be completed. Now, these are things that can be done during the day inside your house. So I suggest you get this done before you go outdoors. It's something you can do and take your time with, but you want to do accurately and correctly. We'll also do our Nina profile and get as much of that set up as possible indoors as well. So that again when we go outside we are as far along in the process as we can be uh, without being too cold and it being too dark. Now when starting our installs at this particular point I'm going to first create and initiate a remote desktop connection from my Mac to that previous device and if you remember I set a DHCP reservation for this IP address so I know exactly what it's going to be every time it boots up. I can go ahead and set this up and connect. Now that I'm connected to the system, I can begin my installs. I always start with ASCOM platform. 
right? We're going to need that for all our ASCOM drivers. So I'm going to go ahead and set that up. I am speeding through these installs. They'll take a little bit longer. I'm next going to do EQ mod and then sharp cap. Once these are done, again, I can just keep cycling through those hardware components, right? So I can start doing things like ASTAP. Don't forget when you do your plate solving program, you're also very likely going to need to add the uh, associated database. I'm going to move on to Pole Master and Pole Master Drivers, and I'm going to move into my focusers. Remember, some of these packages are going to have multiple components, desktop components, network uh, drivers, um, ASCOM drivers. I move on to NIDA, did that install. Again, I didn't do any configuration, just the installation at this point. Don't forget Nina's uh, Sky Atlas database. I'm going to step through into the QHY all-in-one. I'm going to install the components I need there. Um, again, remember, as I'm going through and installing cameras and things like that, you're going to have different devices that you're installing on your system. So just step through and complete it. Once I've got all the components installed, I can go back into Nina and start to set up a profile. So I'm going to go ahead and make the necessary configuration changes here, including putting in my site information, etc. But I'm using the data that I collected earlier. Now this video is not meant to be an in-depth Nina tutorial, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly here. But I do want to make sure that you can see how I am uh, setting it up and what I am stepping through. I happen to have some of the information handy, such as how my focuser behaves. So again, I'm not going to have to fight with that here in this video. Make sure you go through, though, and do configure everything necessary. If you miss something, again, you'll just catch it later. I prefer to set up as much as I can in my profile during the day before I get to that first nighttime uh, session where I'm actually going to test everything out. So here I can see after setting everything up that I was able to get my uh, camera connected. And now I want to work on getting my mount connected. Uh, to do that, I'm going to have to go in with my particular mount and set up um, an EQ mod profile. Mine's on COM4. I have to go in and set that up to make the connection work. I can go set a profile up for my site with the uh, DMS space lat launch and altitude. Make sure you change your time if you're using Nina to J2000. So we're going to set that up as well over here. Um, and once I've got uh, that set up, then I can again go ahead and commit this and move forward with connecting to my mount. So I can see here I've connected to the mount. Everything came up fine. Um, I can do some quick testing. I can park it and make sure that parking works. It does look like it works fine. And again, there's a number of other parameters uh, that you could have set in here. I'm not going to go ahead and set mount limits or any specific mount limits at this point. But there are other things you can do, and you may choose to do it later. So I'm going to go back and restart Nina. I'll go and uh, select my camera one more time, get the camera connected. I can test cooling. Looks like cooling's working as well. I can go ahead and use some of that data I collected earlier to set gain. I'm going to use Unity Gain for this camera, and I can set my offset, etc. I'm going to go in and select my telescope and connect to it. It does connect using EQ mod. That's great. And I can test park and unpark right here from within Nina, and it seems to work just fine. So again, there's a number of things you could connect um, and test out at this point. I'm going to go ahead and start looping some images. And again, I can see my garage ceiling, so I know that my camera is functioning within Nina. And now I can just shut it all down, make sure warming the camera works. The next part of our install is going to be outdoors, right? We're going to start with a rough polar alignment of the mount, then we're going to polar align it effectively. I'm going to use my pole master to do this. After that, we're going to go into Nina and we're going to connect our devices. We're going to finish configuring anything that can be configured once the device is officially connected to Nina. And then we're going to do some testing. We're going to do some test shots. We're going to do some framing. Um, at this point, you do want to align to something that we can use for PhD guiding later uh, in the next step. So uh, make sure you follow along and you'll be just fine. So this is what I like to call install part two. This is where I actually take it outside. And first thing I need to do is make my polar alignment work. So I want to make sure I'm well polar aligned. I'll use my pole master for that. Now I can start Nina. Again, I've set up my profile and I've tested some components, so I should be pretty far along at this point. So we'll let Nina start. I'll go ahead and connect my camera. 
and I can set it to cool. Now, I only have a certain number of components available on this particular test setup, so I won't have to set up a filter wheel, but I do have my Astro Mechanics Canon lens focuser that I can connect. So I'll go ahead and go into settings on that. I'll set it for the appropriate 200 millimeter lens at f4. I'll say OK, and then I'll connect to it. Looks good. And I can select my mount as well and connect to that. Again, you may have some additional things you need to connect. Now let's do a, a test looping exposure. So I'm just going to do two seconds, set it to loop, and start taking images. When the first picture comes up, I can go ahead and stretch that to see the full picture. I want to test out my Sky Atlas. You can see I have images in here, so I know that that is working. I want to find something in here between negative 20 and positive 20 deck, and the reason I'm doing that is because I want to make sure that I can use this same uh, thing that I'm connecting to here to do some tests of my mount, etc., uh, as something I can use with PhD for its initial calibration. Um, so we're going to go ahead and select something, slew to it, we can plate solve it. So we're testing all sorts of things. We're testing the camera. We're testing plate solving. Final part of installation and configuration. So this is guiding, right? I left this for last and I separated it out because not all of you will need guiding, especially if you're building a portable rig. Um, you may just choose to keep your uh, exposure lengths down and let your mount do the work, that's fine. But if you are gonna do PhD guiding, there's a couple things you need to do and we're gonna go ahead and do that now. So first things first, let's install PHD2. Again, I'm going to use the dev release so I can move the stable release to the done folder, install the dev release. Now when you start up for the first time, it's going to ask you to connect your guide camera with a wizard. You can set your guide scope, focal length, and some other parameters. I can tell it where my mount is um, and what driver to use for my mount if there's any other accessories that I'm using. Now I'm going to set a profile up and I'm going to set the profile based on the hardware that I'm using. Next thing to do is set up a dark library so I can get some clean images from this particular guide camera. So I'll go ahead and set that up. I'm only going to do between one and three seconds in duration. I won't go any longer than that probably with this guide camera anyway. Now I can begin looping and tell it to auto select a guide star. And you'll notice that as soon as you do that, the first time it's going to start a calibration process. Again, you should be correctly targeting something that will work for guiding. If you remember previously in Nina, we selected an object that was between negative 20 and positive 20 deck, which will be perfect for our, for our needs here. We can tell it to auto restore calibration so we don't have to go through this process every single time. And now guiding should be working. Give this a little bit of time, let it settle. Once it's settled in, we could go back now to Nina and connect to the guider. We're pretty much up and running at this point, but there are a couple things to consider. Uh, now that we have tested and we are imaging, you may want to go a little bit further and test a, a, a bigger sequence, something with a meridian flip as an example to make sure everything's working. You may want to consider setting mount limits. Uh, you may want to permanently affix this PC to your rig. Other software you want to install like Solarium from a planetarium software perspective. One of the things we're going to talk about in another video is to take this and make it a little bit more portable is to add uh, uh, additional Wi-Fi to the solution, something that we can tether your Android or iPhone to. So for that, I'll be using this little ugly router, uh, AP. It's about $20 on Amazon, and uh, it, it's super handy. It powers directly off USB. But when you couple this with the solution we built in this video, it's going to allow you to take this, move into the field, go to a dark site, run it all off a battery, and still have internet access through your phone, uh, which can be really, really handy when you're trying to solve issues in the field or just trying to pull data from the internet. So hopefully you found this video to be helpful. Uh, check back for my other videos. I have a number of other things coming. Uh, please subscribe and like the videos so that we can get these in front of other people as well. If you have any suggestions on other videos you'd like me to do, let me know. Uh, we have a number of ideas coming, specifically more to do with my imaging and processing as well. Uh, but hopefully this helps and it answers the questions I've been getting in my inbox. Have a great day, clear skies.